Uh, uh, hey, what's that noise? How long have you been sleeping? You try to move your neck. It's a little bit stiff. You've had a good nap, but fell asleep in an uncomfortable position. In the movie theater. Oh, now you remember. The movie was really boring. You were tired after a long day at work, so you couldn't help it. You look around. Everyone's out. You're alone. Everything is clean, with no popcorn or soda cans on the floor. Weird. The credits are rolling down the screen, so it's time to go. It might be pretty late, and you don't want to miss your bus. You get up, stretch, and slowly go to the door. You enter the hallway. No one is there. You're confused. Usually, when you stay at the movie theater so late, someone walks you out and reminds you they're closing. And there's always a mess left by people who have been walking around all day, eating snacks and dropping popcorn to the floor. But now, everything is clean and peaceful. As if the movie theater isn't open at all. You check the bathrooms. No one's there. The lights are dimmed, but you can see where you're going. And still, ugh, everything looks kind of creepy with no one around. Hello? You try calling for people a couple of times. No answer. You follow the exit sign and get to the closed door. Temporarily closed because of renovation. Huh? How long is that temporarily? You start panicking and then suddenly get angry. How could the staff forget to wake you up? You start yelling, trying to open the door, but nothing works. You check your phone. Of course, it's off. You forgot to charge it. Then you suddenly hear some noise coming from one of the halls. You start shivering. Is it possible that someone else is trapped here too? You slowly move toward the hall and cautiously open the door. But it's just the beginning of another movie. This hall is empty too. Trying to distract yourself, you get popcorn, candies, soda, and even some ice. Finally, you're on time to get the best seat. Oh boy, that was epic! You were still sitting and laughing at some of those jokes you heard, when suddenly, a new movie starts. Great, why not see that one too? Workers will probably get here in the morning anyway. Your friends are going to be so jealous when they find out you've spent a night in the movie theater for free. Two more movies later, and you realize you have no idea what time it is, but you feel very tired. Tomorrow's a new day, it'll get better. Grr, still no news. Nobody's come. The noise coming from your stomach is getting louder, so you go and grab some new snacks. Time for some more movies. The marathon that you've always wanted to take part in. You hit the first hall. A comedy is on. You realize each hall shows its own movie genre. And when a movie finishes, a new one immediately starts. At one point, the screen always goes white. It's your cue that it's time to go to sleep. Days pass by with you waiting for workers every morning and watching new movies every day. There's some old movies too, in different languages and from different countries. Your daily routine is always the same. You get up and have breakfast. You found a large stock of sandwiches in the fridge. After watching several movies, you walk around and explore the place. Then lunch, some more movies, dinner, and it's already bedtime. You feel completely hypnotized by all the movies you watch. Some make you laugh so hard you can't fall asleep afterwards because you keep thinking about their plots. Others bring tears to your eyes. Some make you think. And there are movies that scare you so much that instead of falling asleep, you get up every five minutes to check every suspicious noise you hear. Your life doesn't change. No one comes. Every day is the same. At first, you still try to count how many days you're trapped at the movie theater. But after a while, you lose track of time. Your eyes have become red from staring at the screen for hours on end. You sometimes feel terrified when looking at yourself in the bathroom mirror. Your skin has gone pale. You've gained some extra weight. And your shoulders have become rounded from sitting and sleeping in an uncomfortable position. From time to time, you try to work out and add some healthy habits to your life. But most of the time, you feel as if you're the main character of some weird movie. The one where you can't figure out what's real and what's not. You keep seeing things out of the corner of your eye. But when you turn around, there's nothing. 
you decide not to watch scary movies anymore. And then, you accidentally find yourself in a seat, waiting for the next movie to start. And before you know it, the movie has you hooked. And you can't stop watching even though you know you won't be able to sleep at night. You start feeling increasingly lonely. Movie characters become your only friends. You constantly talk to them in your head, or even out loud. The silence after you stop is horrible. And the dark corners of the movie theater seem even scarier at such moments. Your stomach hurts. You're sick and tired of snacks, candies, sandwiches, and popcorn. Unbelievable, but the only thing you're craving is a bowl of warm soup. You don't enjoy movies anymore. Nothing seems funny, sad, or even scary. You often watch a movie not knowing what it's about. It feels as if you're stuck on a deserted island, but kinda worse. There, you'd at least have beaches, sunsets, palm trees, and maybe even a chance to escape after a while. You miss fresh air, sunlight, the feeling of rain on your skin. You close the doors of the movie theater halls and stand next to the ticket office. You're done with opening credits, movie music, your favorite actors. You don't want anything to do with movies. You start exploring the place, paying even more attention to details than you did before. You enter all the halls one by one and try to find new exit options. You start to lose hope, but then you remember something from the movie you saw a couple of days before and run to the bathroom. Here's the vent! It's now or never. It's pretty high. Two garbage cans. Great! Maybe you'll reach it now. Your construction keeps swinging but you somehow manage to crawl into the hole before the garbage can tower crashes down. You have to get through an entire maze up there before you finally get out. Ah, a warm, nice night. It feels as if this is the first time you've taken a deep breath in over a year. The movie theater isn't in the city center, so you start walking home. When you arrive, your roommate can barely believe his eyes. Have you got back from Aruba? He sounds surprised. You have no idea what he's talking about. He says, You were disappointed with your job and didn't know what to do. So you told everyone you needed something different. Maybe a couple of months on Aruba or something like that. So we all thought you wanted to disappear for a while and then get in touch with people again. Your phone was off for a year and you didn't reply on social media. No, it wasn't Aruba the movie theater, all kinds of movies from all over the world, lots of popcorn, the renovation, no one ever came. You try to tell your roommate the story. You're hurrying, missing words, skipping parts of the story, but he's just looking at you, confused. You decide to just show him the place, but when you get there, he doesn't want to come closer. That place has been closed for years. I can't remember ever seeing it open. There's a story about a guy who owned it. He was a great movie fan and wanted to collect movies from all over the world. He was going to renovate this movie theater, but then he suddenly disappeared. No one knew what had happened. The theater was closed down and has been under renovation since then. People have heard noises coming from that building, but no one wanted to come any closer to investigate. Oh, how did you end up in such a place? You suddenly notice someone move near the theater. They start walking towards you. You try to run away, but you can't move. What's going on? You jolt awake in your seat. Was it all just a dream? Credits on the screen mean the movie you've been watching is over. The hall is empty, and you quickly leave it. No one is there. Oh no, not again. Hello? You yell in panic. Silence. And then... Yes? Movie theaters, red seats, big screens, darkness, and popcorn. The idea of going to the movies and not getting some popcorn now sounds absurd. But why did popcorn become associated with this experience? Actually, the snack is thousands of years old, and it's native to the Americas. The oldest years of popcorn date back to 4,000 years ago, and they were found in New Mexico, USA. We don't know exactly how and for what it was used back then, but it existed that long ago. However, we do know that as early as the 16th century, popcorn was important for the Aztec Indians. They ate it, sure, 
but they also used it for their ceremonies, utilizing it as decoration and headdresses for the statues of their deities. Apparently, there was even a specific popcorn dance that girls would perform. Popcorn's supremacy at its best. After that, in the 19th century, popcorn became a very common breakfast food. Yes, people would eat it just like we eat cereal today, with milk or cream. After the use of the moldboard plow became a common practice, it was easy to grow large quantities of popcorn. There was a lot of it, and it was cheap. That's what also made it a perfect thing to use during holidays for food and decoration. The kernels were also a very common gift to give to each other. Today, you probably wouldn't appreciate a pack of popcorn as a gift, but back then, it was so loved that it was the best thing to receive. You could do anything with it. You could cook it, or you could decorate your doorway or fireplace or whatever. Very multi-purpose, and it never goes bad. Like, it really doesn't go bad. How long do you think popcorn seeds last? Apparently, a very long time. Recently, scientists found popcorn kernels from 1,000 years ago in modern-day Chile. And guess what? They still popped after all that time. Popcorn was very popular even throughout the Great Depression. When everything failed, people got poor and businesses went bankrupt. They could still afford a five-cent popcorn bag to brighten up the mood a little bit. When one banker from Oklahoma went bankrupt, he bought a popcorn machine and started selling popcorn on the streets. In a couple of years, he made enough money to buy his three farms back. Despite the tough times, people went to the movies. To attract viewers, ticket prices were reduced to the lowest possible, and quite a few ladies and gentlemen would spend those 10 cents to entertain themselves once in a while. Of course, the experience was very different from the one we have today. Picture this. You put on your best suit and a nice hat and make your way to the movie theater with your wife, who is wearing a beautiful dress and a fancy hat. Yes, it's not sweatpants and a t-shirt. After all, you are going to the theater. The building is a literal movie palace with distinctive architecture and elaborate decorations. You get a drink and popcorn and make your way to your seats, which have ashtrays instead of cup holders. You take off your hat and place it on your lap so that it doesn't obstruct the view for the people behind you. The sign, ladies, please remove your hats, reminds your wife to do the same. Finally, the lights dim, the red velvet curtains open, and you can see the big screen. The movie doesn't start right away. First, it's time for newsreels, movies of events happening around the globe. You can read about those in newspapers or hear about them on the radio. But here, in the movie theater, you've got a rare opportunity to see some footage. After that, a cartoon or two follows, and you enjoy some Mickey Mouse shorts. Only after that does the feature you came to see start. So, what are you watching? Mm -hmm. It might be Frankenstein, It Happened One Night, Modern Times, Mutiny on the Bounty, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, Charlie Chaplin, Catherine Hepburn, Judy Garland, Henry Fonda. Those are the people who shine on the screen, sometimes black and white, and other times in full color. As you're enjoying the feature, Ushers in a uniform quietly sneak into the room with their flashlights, escorting late viewers to their seats. Other times, they look for a particular patron to notify them that they received a call from home and escort them to the box office to take that call. The movie ends, but the night isn't over yet. Back then, people got an over-the-top movie theater experience because there was another feature film afterward, usually an older or less popular one. Many would stay to see that too. But before that, an intermission. You can go and get more treats for the movie while the theater staff uses the time to change reels and start the next feature. In the 1930s, movie theaters were owned by Hollywood Studios and they screened their own movies. This changed in 1948 when a law was passed that allowed any theater to play any feature it ever purchased. That's when the movie theater brands we know today started to appear. 
Just five years later, the first movie theater with stereophonic sound made its debut, improving the acoustics and starting a new era for movies. In the 90s, reels of film were replaced by digital projectors. More and more movies started to be made digitally, and every movie theater that wanted to play them had to invest in modern equipment that allowed them to show the new footage. But this equipment was expensive, and not every theater could afford it, leading to some of them going out of business. From then on, movie theaters evolved into what we know today. The picture quality improved, sound reached a whole different level, red curtains were abandoned, the second feature was dropped, and ticket prices increased. Despite all the changes, one thing remains the same. Popcorn. By the way, at first, movie theaters didn't welcome popcorn inside. But here's how it changed. When people started going to the movies, everyone wanted to bring a snack. That could be anything, but the most obvious choice was candy. In the 1940s, the production of sugar and many other unnecessary goods slowed down, resulting in a deficit. So what could people take to the movies instead? That's when they turned to popcorn, a cheap and well-loved snack. At first, movie theater owners were against it and didn't sell it in their theaters. A bunch of people eating popcorn in the dark were bound to leave too much mess. But, well, the demand was there, so outside vendors appeared near movie theaters, selling popcorn to everyone who wanted to sneak it inside. Movie theater owners gave up and decided to rather make money off of that themselves, and the low price of popcorn made it beneficial for them, too. Now, almost everyone buys some snacks and drinks, and it was common in the early cinema days, too. But did you know that movie theater seats didn't have cup holders until 1981? Yes, AMC was the first theater to install them in the handles, and before that, people just had to hold their drinks the whole time. There must have been way too much mess back then. Still, selling snacks in theaters was the right solution, even if it required quite a bit of cleaning. Did you know that modern movie theaters make most of their money off the snacks they sell inside? Yes, profit from movie tickets mostly goes to the studios theaters buy movies from. A movie theater starts profiting from playing a movie only if it plays it for at least a couple of months, and that's a very long run, which is not for every movie. Meanwhile, profit from snacks mostly goes to the movie theater itself. So, maybe next time don't feel too bitter about overpaying for your popcorn and soda. Those high prices are what keeps many movie theaters in business. They show you commercials for the same reason. This business is tough, and they need to make at least some money to go on. Now, at some earlier stages of research, scientists reconstructed the megalodon looking like a bigger, just a little more dangerous, version of a great white shark. Movies then followed suit, added a couple of details on their own, and ta-da! We've got a marine giant that could grow up to 90 feet long. Well, hold on, hold on. Megalodons were usually between 50 and 55 feet, sometimes growing up to 60 feet. For comparison, a bowling lane is 60 feet long, a school bus is around 45 feet, and an average person is 5 feet 10 inches tall. So yeah, not bad megalodon, but still not 90 feet. Its weight was around 50 to 60 tons, which is something like 10 adult elephants or even a Boeing 737. That's just their females, though. The ladies were almost twice as big as the males. Another movie versus reality thing. The megalodon had nothing to do with a great white shark. The closest they could be is cousins, because Megalodon, in fact, is the last descendant of a completely different lineage of sharks. Plus, its kind is around three times bigger than an average great white. It has a shorter nose and a much flatter jaw that almost looks like it's squashed. Also, Meg's pectoral fins are longer than those of the great white sharks. Ancient predators ate a lot, so they needed something to support their weight. They both had an excellent sense of smell, though, so even in prehistoric times, it wasn't a good idea to go swimming with a chunk of raw meat in hand. And it certainly isn't safe now. Whether the Meg's hiding somewhere in the depths, which some still believe is true, or it's gone forever, younger cousins will be there waiting. 
Also, both of them like to go after big marine mammals, so they would certainly have things to do together. That is, until the May got moody and accidentally ate its friend. Eh, you never know. These guys had a different hunting style. Great whites prefer to dive straight toward their prey and find the softest spots, like exposed legs or underbelly. Megalodon aimed for the fins and tail because of its almost 10-foot jaws and what's considered to be the strongest bite ever. Its teeth could pierce almost anything. Sometimes an entire tooth would be found embedded in the bone of some bigger animal, such as a whale. Without the main parts they used for swimming, poor sea animals were then helpless and unable to escape. Yet whales were just a smaller part of the megalodon's diet. Seals, sea cows, squids, dolphins, other sharks, the good old Meg probably wouldn't say no to some random school of smaller fish swimming into its mouth either. Nothing better than a good snack after a big, tasty dinner. Even those giant turtles weren't safe within their thick shells. The Meg probably took those as a dare challenge on a daily basis. Such a diverse diet, and in big amounts. Megalodon would eat about 2,500 pounds of food every day. No wonder it dominated the ocean. Almost 300 teeth in five rows. And we're talking about sharp chompers that could grow up to 7 inches long. Even its name stands for giant tooth. Hey, I'm thinking maybe it had a cousin, orthodontia, which means either crooked teeth or deep pockets. Still, Megalodon would change thousands of teeth over a lifetime. Since Meg's teeth weren't that strong, they would often fall out. Then it would get new ones within one to two days, so it could continue its hunting sessions without any serious interruptions. The same thing happens with modern sharks as well. New teeth replace damaged or worn out ones. Those teeth falling out were the only thing that helped scientists do any research on the megalodon at all. They found them all around the world. Yep, megalodons were quite some travelers. They lived in all oceans, and their fossils were found on all continents except Antarctica. What? Too cold? Since their skeletons were not made of bone but of cartilage, teeth are the only evidence they've ever even existed. They gave scientists an insight into a lot of things, including size. Even with modern sharks, scientists determine their size by the dimensions of only one tooth, and do the same with the Meg. Megalodon had the strongest bite of all living creatures on Earth. It would definitely be fun to see the clash between the Meg and, say, T-Rex. Sadly, they missed their chance to meet and establish some long-term friendship since dinosaurs went extinct over 60 million years ago. Meg, on the other hand, terrified all the inhabitants of the seas and oceans from 23 to 2.5 million years ago. Where could Megalodon live these days? Well, it would probably love the places modern sharks go to, such as Florida, Hawaii, Brazil, South Africa, or some other tropical paradise. Hmm, when you think about it, it's not bad at all. Meg, <laughs> take me with you! Meg itself didn't have any serious competition or a natural enemy, but its infants were too weak to defend themselves. That's why the apex predator had to choose warm, shallow waters with no strong currents to raise its babies. Those, by the way, were around 6.5 feet long, not quite tiny themselves. Scientists actually found some of their juvenile's teeth, so it seems like part of their nursery areas was the coast of Panama. And that's 10 million years old. Okay, time to meet with one of Megalodon's potential rivals, the mighty sperm whale. 45 to 60 feet long, the size sure makes it quite an adversary. Modern sperm whales don't have such big teeth, but their ancestors, which lived around 13 million years ago, were well packed. The largest tooth found was 5 inches wide and 14 inches long. That's something like the biggest soda bottle out there. That would make an interesting combat. Here, we're talking about this giant marine predator. But this is not the only intriguing ancient animal that wandered the oceans. In fact, sharks are some of the oldest creatures on our planet, more ancient than insects, mammals, dinosaurs, even trees. Mass extinction events wiped out most life on Earth. Giant asteroids fell on its surface. Continents split up. 
and so many other things happened. But sharks were there, alive, persevering, apparently with no contact with the outside world, just chilling and doing their thing. The spiny shark was actually one of the first animals with a jaw. Not that it could do much with that jaw, since it was only around 12 inches long. Eh, Meg wouldn't even bother around this one, and it wasn't even a real shark, it just looked like one. If you ever wondered how a combination of eel and shark would look like, well, here it is. Eel shark preferred fresh water, was up to 3 feet long, and went extinct around 200 million years ago. Since dinosaurs appeared around 230 million years ago, the eel shark was probably there to give them warm welcome, prepare a buffet, but the dinosaurs had unfortunately mistaken it for dessert. Now, this predator would get some real screams on a nice sandy beach during a spring break if it was still alive – the Ginsu shark. It was nicknamed after Ginsu knives for a huge mouth of almost 500 razor-sharp teeth. One of this monster shark's hobbies was to go after big turtles. Okay, now seriously, what's with that shark turtle thing? Scissor-toothed sharks. Now we're talking. These guys lived around 300 million years ago and had some strangely shaped heads. The weirdest part were their jaws. This shark didn't shed old and worn out teeth, but kept growing new ones at the back. Those in the front were then pushed forward, and with age, the shark got a really strange scissor tooth look. Scientists are still unsure why it had to be like that. Hey, time to call in the orthodon! Even during the Meg's long reign, our favorite ancient predator still wasn't the only scary giant shark in town. For instance, um, well, I can't pronounce its name, so I'll just call it Mr. C. Unfortunately, not enough of its fossils were found to get more information. But some research says it had teeth more than 5 inches long. That also implies it could probably grow to be 20 feet long. Oh, and if it only left just a couple more teeth around, I guess the Meg wouldn't be the only movie star from those times. So close, see? So close. Phantasmagory is said to be the first animated film ever. It was made in 1908, and it's one of the earliest examples of hand-drawn animation. But did you know that ancient people entertained children with cartoons about 2.6 million years ago? A new study reveals that ancient people were the ones who first made pictures look animated. How? They carved pictures of animals on stones and placed them around fires. When the light starts bouncing around, those ancient animals just can't help but shake it and shimmy. The prehistoric carvings come to life in the flickering firelight, with those animals jumping in and out of focus like they're ready to party. Imagine how fun it would have been for prehistoric families to sit around a fire and create these animated carvings. It turns out that even some of the ancient wall paintings and carvings found in caves were inspired by their appearance in the moving light and shadows of flames. So, basically, these old-timey carvings were made to come to life when firelight hit them. And now researchers made a movie showing that cool effect on a 3D model of some horse engravings. The study says our brains are wired to see moving things and changing light, which is why these carvings probably mattered to our ancestors. In other words, cave people were like, Hey, let's carve some cool stuff on this rock, and when we light a fire, it'll look like it's moving. And now these scientists were like, That's awesome! Let's make a movie to show this, everyone! Andy Needham and his teammates used modern scanning and virtual reality tech to study 50 flat carved rocks called plaquettes made of limestone. These rocks were found in southern France back in the 1800s and now sit in a museum in London. They are covered in 77 realistic carvings of all sorts of animals, like horses, reindeer, and chamois. Apparently, Homo sapiens, with a lot of time on their hands, made these engravings a whopping 12,000 to 16,000 years ago. Needham realized that many of these carved rocks were harmed by fire, some covered in white ash, others dried or fractured because of heat. Upon closer examination, he discovered pink bands of discoloration resulting from iron deposits in the stone. What's more interesting is that the animal engravings were often superimposed on top of each other, sometimes even melded together or fitted around each other like some kind of prehistoric animal jigsaw puzzle. Rather than tossing out the old and starting anew, the ancient artists took animal body parts to create new hybrids. For instance, 
One of the rocks depicts both a horse and a wild cattle-like creature known as a bovid. In this masterpiece of prehistoric art, the horse's abdomen and neck become the back and neck of the bovid, while the horse's head forms the bovid's ear. What a creative way of recycling! Researchers believe that the prehistoric rocks from Montestric were used as primetime entertainment for our ancestors. More than one person carved the animals. People from different levels of skills showed their artistic glory, and it was a group effort. The fact that these rocks were found together also suggests that this was a community activity. So it's like families were all gathered around the TV, carving rocks and cheering on their favorite carved animals. Who needs Netflix when you have Paleolithic TV? The engravings on these rocks and the signs they were exposed to heat suggest they were created to look like they were moving. Sometimes you see different animals in different poses, so one would come to life, and then another, and then a different one. It's like a Stone Age version of Disney. Similar techniques might have influenced some of the ancient cave paintings, such as those at the breathtaking Chauvet Cave in southeastern France. The animal portraits there are also overlaid on each other, and some look like they were heated by fires underneath them, which means that our prehistoric ancestors might have been the first animators in the world. Alright, since we talked about young people's favorite pastime activity, shall we take a trip back in time to discover the world's oldest toys? One of the most ancient toys discovered was a simple ball made from clay and found in the ruins of ancient Mesopotamia. It might seem like a simple toy, but our ancestors were playing with them as far back as 3000 BC. But back then, they didn't have fancy video games or elaborate board games, so a ball was the pinnacle of entertainment. But the Mesopotamians weren't the only ones having fun. In ancient Greece, children played with dolls made of clay. In Egypt, kids had toys shaped like animals, but they also had dolls made from materials like clay, papyrus, and ivory. But the most impressive thing about these dolls? They had movable limbs. That's right, our ancient ancestors were playing with articulated dolls before it was cool. But it's not all fun and games. Toys also had a practical purpose back in the day. In fact, many of the toys discovered by archaeologists were actually used to teach children important skills. For example, Egyptian children played with dolls that were shaped like doctors, which helped them learn about medicine and healthcare. And let's not forget about the toys that were used to train future warriors. In ancient China, kids played with toy horses and chariots, which helped them prepare for a life of battle. Talk about getting a head start on your career! Moving on to primitive board games, which have been around for over 5,000 years. The oldest board game is called Sinet, and was discovered in ancient Egyptian tombs. It's a bit like a cross between chess and backgammon, and it was so popular that it was played for over 2,000 years. Now that's a game with staying power. But let's not forget about toys for the little ones. Archaeologists have found ancient rattles and whistles that were used to entertain even younger members of their families. And if you thought your kid's toy collection was impressive, just wait until you hear about the ancient Egyptian princess who had over 100 wooden toys in her chamber. But perhaps the most surprising toy of all was the yo-yo. That's right. The yo-yo has been around for over 2,000 years. It was first invented in ancient Greece and was often used in battle, believe it or not. But eventually, people realized that it was much more fun to just play with it and do tricks. Marbles are also around as a toy that has been entertaining kids, and some adults, for thousands of years. Archaeologists have found evidence of marble dating back to around 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley Civilization. Back in those days, marbles were made from all sorts of things. Want to take a wild guess? Okay, I'll tell you. Fruit pits and small pieces of smoothed stone. That's right. Those ancient kids were getting creative with their playthings. Some artisans even went the extra mile and crafted marbles from clay. Let's head back to ancient Egyptians and their adorable miniature boats made from ivory, wood, and clay. These miniatures may be acknowledged as toys, but they were also meant to represent crossing over to the other side. Viking kids had similar types of items too. A wooden toy boat over a thousand years old was found on a farmstead near the coast of Norway. This toy looked like a real boat, and it would have been the ultimate cool thing, just like how kids today go nuts over race cars and drones. You can imagine little ones back then showing off their toy boats to their friends. Many of these toys are still pretty fun to play with today. There are many others left aside, like toy soldiers and spinning tops. 
Do you want to know more about ancient toys or gadgets from the early days of cinema? All right, check this out. Water boils faster when you add a bit of salt. Myth. It doesn't make any difference, and even if it does, it may take longer for the water to boil. But it might make your pasta taste better. <laughs> Just saying. Bats are blind. Mm-mm, not true. The myth probably comes from the fact that they're nocturnal creatures and have extraordinary hearing abilities. They chase mostly when it's dark and rely on a thing called echolocation. But it doesn't mean they're blind. Their eyes aren't useless. They're just adjusted to low light conditions. A blue whale is so big, its tongue can weigh as much as a big elephant. True. Yep, these fellas are huge. You lose more heat through your head. Nah. The real reason why people believe it is because when it's cold, our head is the only part we're most likely to keep uncovered. If we went outside wearing just a t-shirt, we'd lose heat through our arms, not to mention legs, hips, and other parts. So wear a hat, guys. Tongue Map says we have different parts for different tastes. Mm, not really. There are individual taste buds that sense certain flavors more than they do with others. But it doesn't mean one area can taste sweet better than the other. Studies showed all mouth areas have taste buds sensitive to all tastes. Hey, check out this tongue map for the blue whale! <laughs> Looks like she's partial to plankton. Dinosaurs were giant. Well, that's false. Movies show them as huge scaly lizards, but nope. First off, there were many smaller dinosaur species, and some of them were as small as a turkey or a pigeon. Plus, some dinos, like T. rex, were even covered with feathers, especially at the early stages of their lives. Oxygen is colorless. Partially true. In gas form, it has no color, but in solid or liquid form, it has a sky blue shade. Chameleons change color because they want to match their surroundings. Myth. That would probably be a very tiring thing to do. In reality, some other things, like mood, temperature, or the amount of light they get, affect their color. When chameleons relax and stretch cells, crystals that are inside of them are affected by the light. These animals use crystals to communicate with each other. So, for example, darker shades show that they're not in such a good mood. It's more like they kind of feel aggressive. So I think I'll back off here. Neanderthals aren't our ancestors either, even though they lived with modern humans at the same time at one point, but mostly in different areas of our planet. So they're not just a stage of human development, but a different lineage. They were also pretty creative. They used fire, made tools, ate medicinal plants, cleaned their teeth, and so many more things similar to our species. Neanderthals probably went extinct because of harsh climate changes. Turkeys can blush. <laughs> that one is true. They're just like us when it comes to this. When angry, excited, or even feeling bad, the skin on their necks and heads turns red. <laughs> just like my big brother. Black holes are not really holes, as the name may imply. They are very dense objects with an extremely strong gravitational pull. Flamingos are such cool animals. True. They bend their legs at the knee. Myth. They actually bend them at the ankles, since the knees are closer to the body as well as covered in feathers. Supermarket apples are fresh. Eh, maybe yes, but maybe not. They can be up to one year old, since they're often picked between August and November. After that, they're covered in wax and dried in hot air. Finally, they're sent into cold storage, and after 6 to 12 months, we see them on the supermarket shelves. Bottled water has an expiration date? True. But that doesn't mean the water is the thing that expires. The bottle does. The plastic starts to leak into the water, and some unwanted chemicals appear. The tea bag wasn't actually planned. True. In the early 20th century, Thomas Sullivan filled small soaken bags with samples of tea leaves and sent them to his customers. The idea was to open them and toss tea leaves in the hot water. Many customers thought they were supposed to put those bags into the teapot without opening them. The tea bag went through some improvements, got string and a paper tag at the end, and the new unplanned invention was ready. Lightning will never strike the same spot twice. Mm -mm, not true. The Empire State Building was once struck eight times in only 24 minutes. There was a terrible storm, and nothing could or can generally keep lightning away from the place that got hit. If a struck place has features that attracted the lightning in the first place, like terrain shape, standing water, or height, it may attract it once again. You have so much DNA in your body that you can actually stretch it from the sun to Pluto and back. True. And not just once, 17 times. Of course, you're not going to look the same after you do that. Crocodiles are one of the oldest species in the world. Yup. 
they have been around for 200 million years already. Like my neighbors down the street. Opossums sleep while hanging by their tails. You can see that in cartoons and some photos, but in general, they don't. Their tails are really strong, so these animals can grip branches and hold their weight, but only for short periods. Adults are really too heavy to stay in this position for too long, so they wouldn't get much rest. Goldfish have a 3 second long memory. Nope. Those colorful fish are actually really smart. One study showed goldfish could tell the difference between two classical songs. They're not quick learners, true. But after over 100 sessions, which wouldn't be possible if their memory could really last only for 3 seconds. One type of salamander, um, you can read that on your own, go ahead, can extend its tongue over half of its body length in only 7 milliseconds. True. That's 50 times faster than a blink of an eye. Ooh, gotta be fast to catch that tongue map. People can multitask. Not true. Checking emails, talking on the phone, cooking. It seems like doing several things at the same time saves time, but research shows multitasking is not quite possible. Our brain is wired to do one thing at a time. So when we think we're multitasking, it's actually switching tasks, which can take even longer rather than saving us some time. As well as whittling down our attention spans. Earth is not the only planet with water. NASA discovered Jupiter had an ocean with twice as much water as we have on our planet. It's right under a layer of ice. Even Mars has some liquid water flowing. Also, the Earth is round. Or is it? Technically, it has flattened poles, together with a bulge at the equator. That way, it has an irregular shape of an ellipsoid. Zombies are not made up. True. Okay, humans can't turn into ones as we see in movies, but the animal kingdom has its zombies. For instance, there's a type of fungus that takes over ants, spreading specific chemicals in their brains. That makes an ant leave its family, looking for the place where this fungus wants to live. The world's biggest waterfall is under the ocean. Oh, very true! It's in the Nordic seas. The cold seawater is denser than the warm waterfall. The drop is almost 2 miles long. The smallest wasp in the world is not bigger than an amoeba. True. This wasp has the same body parts as other bugs, like eyes, wings, brain, legs, and more, but it's just 0.008 inches long, which, in most cases, makes it smaller than one-celled organisms we also know as amoebas. Snow can only be white. Not true. And I'm not talking about the snow near fire hydrants. For example, there are some mountains with pink snow, like the Sierra Nevada in California. Its color is caused by a certain type of algae living there. Aurora Borealis has a sister. True. It's called Aurora Australis, and you can see it in the southern hemisphere. The best time to see it is in winter. Over 99% of atoms is empty space. True. If we collected all the people in the world together and removed all the empty space between the atoms out of them, the population of Earth would fit into the size of an average orange. I think we should try that. Then I could finally get a seat on the bus. Dolphins communicate and call each other by names. True. They use specific vocal whistles to identify each other. So long and thanks for all the fish. The toilet flushes in different directions when on different hemispheres. Nope. The direction is the same whether the toilet is in Australia or France. Really? A snail can have a pretty extended nap. True. Some snails can sleep for around three years in a row. Sharks smell just one tiny drop of blood from miles away. Eh, not quite. Sure, their brain region in charge of smelling odors is enlarged, but the ocean is really big. Plus, it takes time for odor molecules to spread in liquid. On a pretty good day with favorable currents, a shark may smell the prey from a distance of a couple of football fields away, but not miles. Finally, penguins propose to their significant other. True. They're monogamous, and after choosing a mate, the male gives the female a pebble to show his affection. Ah. Starting with Van, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Thanks to special Pym Particles technology, the heroes of the movie were able to shrink the real Van to the size of a Hot Wheels toy. Hoverboard, back to the future. In 1989, the film's creators envisioned this type of transport being commonplace in 2015. Reality doesn't quite resemble the movie, but we do have a world record for a flight on a hoverboard. Jetpack – GTA San Andreas Character dialogue in the game tells us the cost to develop the jetpack. 
dubbed the Black Project, was $60 million. The main character must take it from a heavily guarded base. Firebolt Broomstick, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban The fastest broomstick in this magical world could accelerate to 150 miles per hour in just 10 seconds, almost like a Bugatti. Magic Carpet, 1001 Nights Its maximum speed is unknown, but we know that it loses its magic abilities if damaged. Standard Kart, Mario Kart The Super Mario Kart handbook encourages cheating to win the game with the words, always keep an eye on your opponent's screen. Light Cycle, Tron Legacy This bike actually exists, and it's street legal. You can get yourself one for $55,000. Speeder Bike, Star Wars This thing can accelerate to 310 miles per hour, faster than a flying arrow. Though, in the real world, during film shooting, it was only going 5 miles per hour. Ah, the magic of editing. Lightning McQueen, Cars. He's something between a Ford GT and a Corvette. His number 95 is an Easter egg. Pixar's first movie, Toy Story, came out in 1995. The Giga Horse, Mad Max Fury Road. An impractical gas guzzler from the Mad Max universe has 1,200 horsepower. That's like two Lamborghini Hurricanes. The DeLorean, Back to the Future. The famous trilogy about time travel made this car so popular, the manufacturer decided to restore its production after 30 years. The Mystery Machine. Scooby-Doo would definitely be scared if he knew that such vans sell for almost $60,000 these days. Zoinks! The Pink Sedan, The Simpsons. For 28 years, the creators of the animated series kept the intrigue alive about what kind of car the family had. But in one of the episodes, we finally found out that it's a 1986 Plymouth Junkerola. The Tumbler, The Dark Knight. Despite its bulky appearance, it's still a high-speed car. It can go from 0 to 60 in 5.6 seconds. There's a version of this Batmobile that's street legal. You can get one for $1 million. The Pursuit Special, Mad Max Fury Road The last of the V8 Interceptors had a gas-guggling V8 engine, a real luxury in this fictional dystopian world. Chevrolet Camaro Transformers When it transforms into Bumblebee, this Chevy gets 17 feet tall. Bumblebee's character traits were based on Marty McFly from Back to the Future. Kit Knight Rider This car is a heavily modified Pontiac Firebird. Kit's main feature was artificial intelligence, and the name is an acronym for Knight Industries 2000. The Black Beauty, Green Hornet. The highly modified 1965 Imperial Chrysler Crown was gorgeous and dangerous. It was full of all the gadgets a superhero and his sidekick could need to fight crime. It was driven by none other than Bruce Lee as Cato. The Ectomobile, Ghostbusters. This was an old 1959 Cadillac Miller Meteor ambulance. Any scenes showing the car backfiring were real. The thing actually broke down on the Brooklyn Bridge during filming. The Night Bus Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban A bus as tall as a giraffe, its height caused a lot of inconvenience during filming. The three-story bus couldn't pass under bridges, so they made the third deck removable. The Cat Bus My Neighbor Totoro This unusual living bus moves on 12 legs. Its interior is soft and covered with fur, and the cat's eyes are the headlights. The Terror, Master of the World by Jules Verne. This amphibious machine could move on land, in the air, on and underwater. On land, it could reach speeds of 150 miles per hour. In the air, 200. Not bad for a story written in 1904. T-70 X-Wing Starfighter Star Wars It can accelerate to 650 miles per hour and travel at 100 megalites per hour. Its design isn't very efficient, though. It probably wouldn't be able to fly in real life. Rex Metal Gear Solid The name Rex was given to it because of its similar appearance to the T-Rex. The cockpit is in the metallic dinosaur's jaws. Mumakil Or Elephant, as they call him in Westron. This giant elephant-like creature is like a natural tank thanks to its thick skin. Arrows and spears can't get through it. Appa. Avatar, the last airbender. 
This is a flying bison-like creature that accompanies Ong in his adventures. Appa may look cute and cuddly, but he's as big as a school bus. Ad at Walker – the most recognizable walking machine from the Star Wars universe. The inspiration for its design was the Paraceratherium. Say it with me now. Paraceratherium, <laughs> a prehistoric hornless rhino that lived 30 million years ago. The Dreadnought – this is a giant tanker that would nearly take up the length of a tennis court. It's the most powerful car in the Death Race universe. The Blackbird – X-Men – the team of superhero mutants gets around in a jet highly inspired by a Lockheed SR-71. Only theirs can take off and land vertically. It can accelerate up to 2,175 miles per hour. Millennium Falcon – Star Wars – the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy also exists in real life. An exact replica was built to shoot one of the films. Sandcrawler – Star Wars – the Jawa's giant moving shelter is equipped with a magnetic field that lets the machine swallow up metal and droids like a vacuum cleaner. Tripod – The War of the Worlds – This terrifying machine had a heat ray and tubes that emit a cloud of toxic black smoke. These aliens would have easily taken over our planet, save for bacteria they weren't immune to, but humanity was. Oops, spoiler! The Black Pearl – Pirates of the Caribbean This is the fastest vessel in the pirate universe. The ship used for filming is actually called the Sunset. The Flying Dutchman – Pirates of the Caribbean According to legend, the captain of the ship brought a curse on the entire crew, and they couldn't go ashore. The curse has not been lifted, so perhaps this ship is still drifting on the oceans. The Endurance – Interstellar The movie was incredibly precise in its details. This ring-shaped station, almost as wide as a Boeing 747 wingspan, could work in real life. Howl's Moving Castle – It's gigantic and intimidating. But the massive cannon on its front doesn't work. The 20-story high castle moves almost completely silently. Nautilus – 20,000 leagues under the sea This fictional submarine was as long as three blue whales and reached highway speeds. The most isolated place on Earth, Point Nemo in the South Pacific, was named after the ship's captain. Wait, it wasn't named for the little clownfish in the Disney movie? Hmm. Gypsy Danger – Pacific Rim this giant robot was created to fight Godzilla-type monsters. It's 10 times heavier than an Airbus A330. Megazord – Power Rangers Each of the mighty morphing Power Rangers could summon their own Zord robot. But when enemies got too big, the team assembled into one Megazord that's taller than the Statue of Liberty. Normandy – Mass Effect This is the frigate that Commander Shepard used to save the galaxy three times. It had an excellent stealth system that made it invisible to other ships. Shield Helicarrier – Marvel Universe This massive aircraft simply couldn't exist in real life. But there's much more advanced technology in this fictional world, so they managed to supply energy to a machine this size. USS Enterprise – Star Trek There were nine Enterprise starships in total. This one was equipped with a warp drive, which allowed it to travel much faster than the speed of light. Snowpiercer – it's a giant among trains. When the world was frozen in a new ice age, this train traveled non-stop on a ring around the Earth. Imperial Star Destroyer – Star Wars We've officially entered mile territory. The cost of this colossal ship was almost 4 billion Imperial credits. For comparison, in the Star Wars universe, you can buy a small spaceship for just 10,000 credits. London – Mortal Engines Yes, it's a moving city. The mega metropolis three times the height of the Burj Khalifa got around with the help of seven giant wheels. It absorbed other small cities along the way. Standard Island – Propeller Island This oval-shaped floating island is 4 miles long and 3 miles wide. It was made to travel the waters of the Pacific Ocean. Oh, and only millionaires live on it. V'ger – Star Trek This is a creature that looks like a spaceship. In the Star Trek universe, USS Enterprise could fly freely inside this monster. The Death Star – Star Wars The massive spherical space station has 560 decks and holds 2.4 million passengers and crew. Uh-oh, kaboom! 
Oops, spoiler. TARDIS. Doctor Who. From the outside, it looks like a standard UK police box. But if we talk about the inside of the Doctor's time machine, well, its size is infinite. A huge train is rushing down the tracks. Brakes screeching. In a few seconds, a thousand-ton steel battering ram will crash into a bus that is stuck on the railroad crossing. Only a miracle can save the people. Wait, what's that? Moments before the collision, a human figure appears. The person's flying off the nearby mountain with a jetpack behind their back. Their body is protected by an exoskeleton. The suit is similar to the armor of a knight and makes a person incredibly strong. They land in front of the train and press their hands on its front. The exoskeleton absorbs the impact. Wheels screech like crazy. Then, a loud whistling squeal. And, just a few feet away from the bus, the train finally stops. The bus doors aren't working. People can't get out of it. The hero produces a lightsaber from their belt and cuts a new door. This scenario might seem too fantastic, but a lot of cool things previously seen only in comics and movies are now reality. Sarkos Robotics Exoskeleton makes the operator 20 times stronger, reduces the likelihood of injury, and doesn't restrain movement. This model is just one of many examples. In the near future, these mechanisms will appear on the streets and will become as familiar as flying drones or hoverboards. In such a suit, you can both rescue people and lift a fridge upstairs alone. But the armor seems incomplete if it can't fly. Richard Browning is the founder of Gravity Industries, a company developing jetpacks. He's also the chief test pilot. His apparatus consists of a large jet engine behind the back and two smaller ones on either arm. The person dressed in it looks like a character in a sci-fi action movie. If you weigh less than 200 pounds, this backpack will let you fly. The catch? Right now, it costs $440,000 to make one. The lightsaber is what fun science means. Several generations of scientists, bloggers, and Jedi fans are trying to create their trademark. The main contender for a lightsaber is high-energy plasma. The strength of the magnetic field will help the plasma keep its shape in the air. But there's a problem. To make the saber work, you'll need to carry a lot of equipment with you. And let's not forget about the ultraviolet radiation and heat that comes from hot plasma. The Burner Metal Vapor Torch is currently the best alternative to the Jedi Sword. This device cuts through a metal door in a few seconds, but fencing with a torch won't work. The cloak that makes a person invisible is no longer a fantasy. Canadian company Hyper Stealth Biotechnology Corp has developed a fabric that will make you disappear. There's no magic in the work of the cloak, just good old physics. This cloak of invisibility creates an optical illusion that hides you from prying eyes. Since 1985, the hoverboard got lots of attention from people all over the world, and inventors have been trying to recreate this design for decades. Many companies have developed their own flying skateboard designs, there's a hoverboard powered by a stream of water, burning kerosene, electricity, or rotating propellers. Arcs Pax Hendo is the closest to its sci-fi prototype. The model can fly in all directions, turn and break. This is possible due to two magnetic fields that repel each other. In 1947, US engineers looked at the car and decided it was boring. Or maybe we can make it fly. Great idea, that. The result of their work was the Model 118 Conv Air Car. Roughly speaking, they took a passenger car and attached a plane with a propeller to its roof. Companies around the world continue to invest millions of dollars in the flying car project, although their cars today look more like drones or helicopters. Many researchers are confident we'll never build a flying car. It's too expensive and dangerous. Who knows? In the 19th century, people said these four-wheeled carts would never replace a horse. But today, a comfortable ride on the highway always beats riding a horse in the prairie. While engineers are trying to get cars to fly, their colleagues have made it so that transport 
doesn't need a driver anymore. The computer takes over the controls. If you need to go to a supermarket or restaurant, your self-driving car will choose the best route itself. It also knows how to park. I should have started with this. The car distinguishes between other road users thanks to sensors, video cameras, and powerful computer processors. It notices traffic signals and road signs. The robo-taxi project is one of the most promising ones in the field. Most likely, in the next 10 to 20 years, driving schools will become a thing of the past. For thousands of years, ancient people sat by fires and looked at the starry sky. Our civilization has already explored space firsthand, but there are still more questions than answers. There have been 600 astronauts in space in 60 years. Of these, seven people are tourists who have visited the International Space Station. For the right to see our planet from a height of 250 miles, you have to pay $50 million. SpaceX and its owner Elon Musk are willing to establish a colony on Mars by 2050. One million people will settle in the first ever Martian city. You don't have to get on board a spaceship to feel like you're on another planet. 80% of the world's oceans are unexplored and unmapped. Marine vessel manufacturers offer to explore the seabed in comfort. To this end, they've developed submarine yacht designs that combine comfort and safety. The private submarine Migaloo M5 is as long as the Washington Monument is tall, and it can stay underwater for four weeks. The set includes a hangar with a helicopter, jet skis, and mini bath escapes. There are no buyers yet, but it's only a matter of time. Imagine that you're a scuba diver who descended to the bottom of the ocean. There's darkness all around you, but the flashlight can handle it. You breathe liquid that fills your helmet up to your eyes. Wait, what? We can't breathe water or, for example, soda, because these substances don't have enough oxygen, not because they're liquid. In the future, scuba divers will breathe liquid enriched with oxygen. It'll also allow for deep diving. American company Second Sight Medical Products has developed an artificial eye that can restore vision to a blind person. It's called Argus 2. It's actually an electronic retinal implant and the first step in creating the bionic eye. Perhaps in the future, it'll be able to zoom in and out of objects, make the image clear, or turn on infrared light. Augmented reality glasses haven't reached technical perfection yet, most futurists are confident they'll change our world, just like the internet did. Why do you need a TV or computer? At your command, the glasses will lower a virtual screen of any size in front of you with your favorite TV series. The same applies to furniture, clothing, and dishes. All this will be replaced by virtual stuff. Augmented reality glasses digitize any item that surrounds you and makes it look how you want it to. Unless you take them off, of course. Today, you have a Mediterranean landscape out your window, and tomorrow, you've got a view of Times Square. Hard drives and computer optical drives store enormous amounts of data, but this technology is unreliable. Over time, disks become unreadable. Scientists have almost solved this problem. They learned how to write electronic data into the DNA of living bacteria. Biological processes take place inside every living cell, Scientists have managed to program them using computer systems methods. Nanobots will appear in the next 10 years. In movies and comics, villains are most often associated with this technology. In the real world, nanobots will be used in medicine. Each robot is no larger than a molecule. By launching a flock of nanobots into the human body, doctors will be able to monitor the health and physical condition of their patients. And probably the best thing about nanobots is that they can be 3D printed. Cloning a dinosaur might not seem like a good idea in movies, but real scientists say it's not even an option. Genes can be used for cloning if they're no more than 1 million years old, and dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. But there are other animals as well. There's a high probability that mammoths will reappear on Earth in the next 50 years, as well as woolly rhinoceroses and even saber-toothed tigers. 
scientists plan to implant genetic material of extinct animals into the DNA of existing ones, elephants, rhinos, and tigers. In sci-fi movies, we often see spaceships and stations shooting colorful beams into space that attract other ships. Australian scientists have managed to create such a beam, only it's invisible. Their beam is capable of capturing and holding atoms floating in a vacuum. Of course, these aren't huge space stations yet, but this is a big step in the study of physics. Scientists have created a quantum funnel that will allow studying the individual atoms and molecules that make up everything around. That's it! You're here! The greatest entertainment ever! Full D Cinema! You step into a dark hall with a big round screen, put on a headset, and feel like millions of sensors connect to your brain's neurons. Three, two, one, and you become the main character of an incredible movie. It's nighttime. You're in your bed, snuggling in your covers from the crisp coolness. You hear creepy noises, as if something's scratching walls from inside. You get out of bed and feel growing tension in the air. You head to the light switch, turn around, and notice a dark figure behind you, right beside your bed. Its features are hidden by the shadow, but it's staring at you. You realize it's a horror movie and turn on the lights. The shape disappears. You turn the light off again, but the phantom isn't there. You hear a low, hoarse howl. Upside down, right on the ceiling, there's an old woman standing on all fours. She screeches and jumps at you. Heart racing, you rush out of the room and shut the door right in her face. You're lucky it's just a movie. Otherwise, you'd have had nightmares after this. You're in the kitchen now. Out the window, first rays of the rising sun are showing. Some kind of motivational music is playing, but you can't understand where it's coming from. A blender, two eggs, and a carton of milk are on the table. You make a protein shake and notice that you're already wearing a tracksuit. You go outside, the music gets louder, and you start running. Buildings and streets flash past you in seconds. You feel uplifted and realize you're in a sports movie now. You're in great physical shape and ready for achievements. But your mood vanishes the moment a building next to you explodes. You're thrown aside, but stay perfectly unharmed, just like an action movie hero should. There are more explosions nearby, and you start running to survive. An SUV with tinted windows appears from around the corner. You slide over its hood and get on a parked sports motorbike. It seems to have been waiting just for you, ready to go. You're driving away from the chase. Behind you, the asphalt's cracking. Cars are thrown aside like toys. Windows are smashing. Ahead, you see a huge truck with a wooden springboard pressed against its back. You pull the throttle to the max, the bike revs, and you're in the air already. And timely, too. A huge explosion is right behind you. You smash through a window of the nearest building and jump off the bike. You're in a gray room with old furniture. The window you crash through is already intact, and raindrops are pounding on its pane. You feel exhausted and confused. You walk from side to side, looking at the street below. Suddenly, you feel a creative impulse. At this point, you notice a desk with a typewriter in the corner. You sit down and start typing like crazy. Words and sentences pour out of you onto a blank sheet of paper. You're sure that you're writing a masterpiece. In reality, the text is complete gibberish, but not for you. The tension is so hard that you start crying. Hours pass in seconds, night and day replace each other, and there's a stack of written pages on your desk. You grab the manuscript and see the editor reading it. A tear runs down her cheek, and she says you've written something unbelievable. But at what cost, you say? This book took everything from me. You have no idea what exactly it took from you, but you feel it because you're in a drama. You leave the editor's office and find yourself in the street, right in the middle of a traffic jam. A man pokes his head out of a car window and says, Hey, stranger, what a day! A cycler passes by, shouting on the go, Please don't stop and say hooray! You find yourself answering, I don't know what you mean, but it's awesome and I'm in! It turns out that you have a beautiful voice. 
people around you get out of their cars and sing along with you. A crow sitting on a lamppost and pigeons walking by also join in on the song. Everyone around is dancing like they rehearsed it, and a fire truck splashes water on the crowd. The song gets louder and louder. You want to, you want to live forever here in the musical comedy. Wow, <laughs> that was awesome. You walk into a dark alley, and everything around you fades to shades of black and white. You're wearing a hat from the 1950s. You hear the wail of police sirens, someone screams, the sound of glass breaking apart. This city, mired in greed and deception. It seems that you just said this out loud. Cool. Now you're in a noir detective film. You're sitting in the office. An empty glass and scattered notes are on the desk. December 17th, 1954. I haven't slept for two days now. A beautiful woman appears in the doorway. Detective, I need your help, she says. You drive a retro car through a black and white city at night. You realize it's not a movie, but a trailer of a detective flick. The picture changes to intense music. Now you're arguing about something with your partner. Next, you're in the middle of a car chase. You kick out some door. Freeze! Close-up of handcuffs being fastened on someone's wrists. The music gets more intense, and a voiceover says, This summer. You throw a lighted match on the ground, and everything goes up in flames. Banknotes fall from the sky. The next image is you walking in the heavy rain. Drops fall from your hat in slow motion. You're grinning. A very dark detective, the voice says, and the trailer ends. And just like that, the world returns to color. You're passing through a busy street, and you see a banana peel lying on the road. You walk around it and hear laughter. You don't understand where it comes from, but you see two fruit vendors nearby. One gives the other a couple of bucks, since he just lost a bet. The loser asks you, was it so hard to slip and fall? You shrug in response and hear that laugh again. It's like a crowd of invisible people watching you and laughing at your every action. All right, you're in a sitcom. A granny walks by and slips on the banana peel. Fortunately, you catch her in time. The vendor who won the bet gives back the money and you hear the laughter again. You know, darling, for a hundred years, no one's ever saved me from bananas, the granny admits. The laughter behind the scenes gets louder. You're annoyed and rush into the nearest supermarket. You walk between the rows and fill the food cart. Several people approach you from different sides and shoot you on cameras with huge lenses. One of them is even lying on the floor, hiding behind apple boxes. They're sure you can't see them. A calm and pleasant voice says, the feeling of hunger makes it put more food in the cart. At the checkout, this human being will understand it may not have sufficient money for everything. You agree with the voice and put the chocolate milk bottle back on the shelf. People with cameras follow you around at a distance. Now it's going through a common ritual in the human environment, standing in line to buy food. You're probably in a wildlife documentary right now. You understand how animals feel then. You walk out of the supermarket, and suddenly, an earthquake hits. People are screaming all around, and spaceships appear in the sky. An alien invasion. You get into a parked black car, and it transforms into a starship. You maneuver in the sky, dodging blasters. Enemy ships are chasing you. You call your adult son over the phone. Son, I never told you this before, but I love you very much. You're the most precious thing in my life. Please, take care of yourself. Dad, what's happening? Dad! The son asks, but you turn off the phone. You're in a sci-fi action movie with elements of drama. Your starship goes into space, and you see the huge invaders arc. You slip by enemies and crash into their command center. A huge explosion lights up outer space. Humanity has won. You're declared a hero, but no one knows that you managed to catapult from your spaceship at the last moment. Now, you live a peaceful life with your family in a beautiful village. The End Starring you Coming soon to a theater near you You're sitting in a car in a space shopping mall parking lot. You've just bought a gift for your sister's birthday and should have time to get it to the celebration. Today, there are a lot of people in the mall, so it's difficult to leave the parking lot. Finally, you're approaching the gate. You press the button next to the steering wheel and activate the gravity cushion. It allows the car to hover above the ground at several inches. 
the car wheels are sliding inside the body, and a huge turbine is coming out of the trunk. The front glass becomes a touch panel with many buttons and screens. The gate opens, the turbine releases a flame, and your car flies out of the parking lot, right into outer space. Thousands of flying cars are rushing past you on an invisible space highway. You're moving away from the mall, which looks like a huge space station surrounded by holograms of advertising brands. Before Earth, you need to get to Mars. There, you want to repair the car's engine. The navigator plans a route to the red planet, and you go on your way. You're far from Earth's orbit, so you can get to Mars in several hours. You activate the autopilot and decide to take a little nap. It's 2048. The world's population has exceeded 20 billion people. There's too little space on Earth. Humanity is not ready to colonize other planets yet. So scientists and engineers from all countries start building huge space stations. This unloads the planet by more than 50%. The stations look like huge rings. They imitate the Earth's atmosphere, have artificial gravity and vegetation. People move to stations, but often return to Earth. Rockets fly between the planet and orbit, but such transport is expensive and inconvenient. Automakers make efforts at creating super reactive flying cars. Some years later, people slowly colonize the Moon and Mars. Now, getting to the red planet is as easy as getting to the neighboring city. Cars fly along certain routes that are similar to airways for planes. Engineers create special digital highways that can only be seen through the windshield. Of course, you can fly through space as you like in any direction. But if you fly to a mall or the moon, you have to stick to the established digital route. You wake up and approach Mars. People almost don't live here because of the unfavorable atmosphere and difficult weather conditions. But Mars has the biggest service center for cars and the coolest amusement theme park in the solar system. To get there, people have to stand in a space traffic jam for hours. The dashboard shows you have some problems with the turbine. You put on a spacesuit, take a laser screwdriver, and get out of the car. You're in zero gravity, flying up to the turbine and fixing the problem with the screwdriver. There are thousands of cars around you. People are yawning inside, listening to music, and watching movies. You get into the vehicle and slowly move on. The engine or turbine often fails in the middle of a space highway. When this happens, your car activates its emergency mode. The dashboard automatically sends a signal to the nearest repair team. You're just floating in space and waiting until the mechanics arrive. They tow the car to the nearest auto service. You have enough oxygen inside for a couple of days. And if you run out of it, you can ask for help on the internet. Good people flying by will stop and share their oxygen supplies with you. Finally, you get to the car service station. Mechanics install a new super jet engine for your car and repair the turbine. There's not much time left and you promised your sister you wouldn't be late. You get into the car and leave the Martian orbit at full speed. The new engine runs silently and doesn't shake the car. You increase the speed and fly along an almost empty digital highway. On your way, you meet a lot of small satellites showing holographic ads. Fortunately, you have an ad blocker. You turn it on and the space banners become invisible through your windshield. Finally, you see a small blue dot. This is Earth. At this moment, you remember that you need to feed your dog. You leave the route and fly to the moon. There you have a small cottage with a house, which you bought for a small price last year. People can't change the atmosphere of entire planets yet, but you can install a small dome and fill it with oxygen. Inside your dome, you've built a house, a swimming pool, and even a small vegetable garden. In the past, people went to the countryside to take a break from the city bustle. Now, everyone just buys houses on the moon. You fly through the dome, land on the white surface, and put food into a dog bowl. They're renovating your apartment on the space ring, so you live on the moon with your dog for a while. You can see other cars flying up into the neighboring domes. Some vehicles are elite supercars with a large gravity cushion and ultra-reactive engines. They can fly 10 times faster than the speed of sound and have artificial intelligence that can talk to the driver. There are also old, rusty space cars. Sometimes people attach a jet engine to an ordinary car 
and cover the body with a mix of copper, iron, and silver to travel over long distances in a cold vacuum. You can also see a lot of taxis in outer space. Sometimes, getting to the moon is cheaper than getting to the other end of some city on Earth. The reason is traffic jams on the Earth's roads. Also, there are a lot of flying buses in space. Every day, several flights depart on the Earth to Moon to Mars route. People are constantly building something on Mars. The huge car service and the amusement park are done. Now they're creating a scientific center there to study interstellar jumps. Of course, engineers need building materials for such construction projects. Several times a week, long trains fly from Earth to Mars along a separate space route. Initially, trains carried people, but they became unprofitable. It's much cheaper and faster to get to Mars by your own car or bus. Finally, you're leaving the moon and approaching the Earth. The dashboard signals you're out of fuel, so you decide to stop at a gas station. These stations are everywhere. They're fully automated, controlled by artificial intelligence. You're flying up to one of them. The fuel pump is automatically connected to your gas tank. The super reactive engine consumes improved rocket fuel instead of gas. You transfer money to the station through the touch panel and fly away. Hundreds of digital space highways lead to Earth, and every road is filled with cars. Traffic jams again. There are security checkpoints in the upper layers of the atmosphere. Customs services check documents and car trunks. While standing in traffic, you're watching garbage trucks. A lot of space debris is floating around. Slow-flying trucks controlled by artificial intelligence collect garbage in huge containers. Then, they fly away from Earth's orbit and unhook the containers. These garbage cans have little turbines that let containers fly far beyond our solar system. Then, they heat up and burn all the garbage from the inside. Finally, you pass all the checkpoints and fly into the middle layers of the atmosphere. Our planet looks like a huge cyberpunk world, but only lighter and more beautiful. Huge cars disperse the clouds to improve visibility. Firefighter flying ships are coming to one of the stations where a fire started. You encounter hundreds of gas stations, air hotels, cinemas, and shopping malls in the sky before you reach the ground. You're approaching a parking building. This is an 80-story skyscraper filled with cars. People leave their vehicles and use elevators to go down. Fortunately, there's a place near your sister's house where you can park your car. You land, put your hand on the passenger seat to take the gift, and... Oh no! It looks like you left it on the moon! The world is tired of bad news, so now you'll see funny and weird news of 2020, only on the Bright Side channel. Because of the worldwide lockdown, the streets of big cities are empty, but not for long. City roads, squares, and parks have received new guests, wild animals. Fortunately, self-isolation ends, and people return to their usual way of life. But what if self-isolation had lasted much longer? Let's have a look at it in the movie trailer format. A team of brave explorers from the most remote parts of the galaxy has a hard time. After losing in battle, the captain teleported his ship to unknown territory to save his crew. Hold on, we're getting closer. To what? Earth? planet because they love alien invasions a young planet may seem like an island of paradise amidst the cosmic darkness I see... descendants of primates. What's that? They don't look like primates. But it can turn into a real nightmare. 
Over here! These ones look more like primates. Excuse me? Uh, we've been self-isolated for too long. Trying to solve one problem, we didn't notice another. They took us by surprise. Those who tried to get out were driven back. Every day we watched from our windows as they were taking over the city. You must help us! Some year, but probably never. Save the planet. From the planet itself. This is your planet, so take it back. You humans are the most dangerous animals on this planet. So prove it! What? Come on! The Oregon police received strange calls in Mark. People called the police several times because they ran out of toilet paper. We don't know how the police could help in this situation, but let's see what it would look like if someone shot a movie about it. Another boring day. It seemed so good at first, remember? I mean, all the criminals sitting at home. Uh, who knew their job would become so tedious? I miss the danger. Yeah, me too. Detective Jones lives there. Please, it's gone again. Somebody, help! Ma'am, what happened? Say your address. Mods, get up. How'd you say? Miss the danger? I left it here yesterday evening. And now it's empty! Is this some kind of a sick joke? Toilet paper's running out? And people call the police? It isn't running out, mods. It's being stolen! The safest place in your home. They're playing with us. Can turn into the most dangerous one. Freeze. People are scared, and we got nothing. What are we going to tell them? That we have wet wipes? Don't move! <gasps> Next news. In Somalia, Locals visit a psychologist to cope with depression and bad mood. Doesn't seem like news, but the psychologist is a hyena. Yeah, a real wild hyena. People believe it can repel evil genies that cause bad humor. The hyena sits in a cage and roars when people approach it. That's the session. I wonder what the life of this hyena would be like if it lived in a megalopolis. Let's see. 
I've got a new job. Established a personal life. In fact, I didn't expect anything from these meetings, but it seems you've brought me back to life. Meet Greg. He's a hyena. And he helps people to be happy. But he has a big problem. Doctor, are you listening to me? No one can help him become happier. When fate wants to tell you something, you'd better listen. To find yourself in this world, Doctor, are you okay? You need to search. Hyena and the Search for Happiness Ah, baby T-Rex was adorable. There, I said it. Hard to imagine those two words in the same sentence. But come on, even Big Bad T-Rex didn't pop out of its shell all big, scary, and fully grown. In its first few months on Earth, baby T was a cute, fluffy, turkey-sized ball of fuzz. It was kind of like a weird-looking bird coming out of an oversized egg. Not enough food, dangerous surroundings, asteroids, hmm. Poor baby T's were so helpless and weak, only about half of them made it to their first birthday party. Scientists think their fuzz was there to keep them warm when they were still small and vulnerable. Plus, it helped them camouflage and stay safe. Baby T's didn't have big, sharp teeth, yet. So, they mostly munched on smaller reptiles and insects. Baby T's grew up pretty fast. They put on up to 6 pounds a day. Hey, I've done that. No, not really. Just felt like it. The weirdest fact about them? When they were little, their arms looked totally normal compared to their bodies. But by the time they were full-grown, their parents were super famous. Plastered all over t-shirts. Um, that would be a T-Rex t-shirt. Um, movies, and the greatest Halloween costume ever, in my humble opinion. But the T-Rex we know and love didn't really exist. First of all, speed. They weren't really that fast. In the movies, you could never get away from them, even if the path was clear and you were in a pretty decent car. Early predictions were that T-Rexes could run somewhere between 10 and 30 miles an hour, which is whoa! But recent research shows they could only reach around 12 miles per hour. Anything more than that would have shattered their massive bones. So relax. After a couple months of training, even the most dedicated couch potato could get away from the sharp teeth of this guy. And what about our good friend Stegosaurus? It lived around 150 million years ago, so it didn't even get the chance to meet those cute baby teeth. They appeared much later. We all recognize this dinosaur. It's the one with those ridiculous upright plates on its back. They were sometimes up to 3 feet tall. You could hide behind one. Scientists still don't really know why they had them, but they think Stegosaurus could have regulated blood flow through them, like a massive bony thermostat. They also believe these dinos could use the same system to control their skin color, depending on whether they wanted to look good or look scary sounds impressive, right? Well, at least something about them does, because this poor thing had a brain that weighed just a tiny bit more than a tennis ball. 
and was around the size of a walnut. That's a dog's brain in a hippo's body. Troodon was one of the most brainy dinosaurs. A great all-around fella, excellent hunter, stereoscopic vision, 6 feet long, and a brain that just won't quit. What a catch! Troodon's remains were one of the first dinosaur discoveries in North America. One of the weirdest members of the dinos was definitely… well, let's just call her Sue. If you met her, you'd feel like you're looking at a big turkey rat thing with a super furry body. It might be the long-lost grandma of the modern ground sloth. Its buddy, Pegamostax, definitely wasn't far behind when it comes to racking up the weirdo points. It looked like something between a porcupine and parrot. But don't say that to its face, it had a couple of pointy teeth that could sharpen against one another. The largest and one of the heaviest known dinosaurs was Argentinosaurus. No one ever found a complete skeleton, but this beast must have weighed about 100 tons and was about 130 feet long. Compare it to the biggest animal we have now, the blue whale. It's only 100 feet long. When someone says dinosaur, you probably imagine some big-as-a-building beast that could use a tree as a toothpick. Some of them were gigantic, true, like those long neck long tail dinos. Those things were as long as an airplane. But many of them were small and lightweight, some of them the size of pigeons. The smallest dinosaur skeleton ever found was a tiny mouse lizard. Some dinosaurs had tails that were more than 45 feet long. That way, it was easier for them to keep their balance when running. But they didn't drag their tail along the ground. Dinosaurs kept pretty active and were quite fast. So they kept their tails in the air most of the time. Even though that naughty asteroid wiped most of them out, a lot of dino DNA stuck around and morphed into animals we know today, like birds. The first time anyone even thought of linking the two together was after they discovered a primitive bird in Germany. Sehr gut. Later, researchers classified two groups of dinosaurs, depending on what kind of hips they had. The first group looked pretty familiar. They had lizard-like hips. The second group had bird-like hips. And a third group looked like Shakira, which is where her tune My Hips Don't Lie comes from. Actually, no. Also, plenty of old-school carnivores had bones filled with air, which is something birds have too. Birds may be the dinosaurs' living descendants, but some animals actually witness the age of dinosaurs. If only they could talk. Snakes, bees, sharks, crabs, lobsters, yum, crocodiles, cockroaches, even green sea turtles. They all actually saw real dinosaurs. So jealous. Carnivore dinos mostly walked on two feet. That way they could be faster and have their hands free to grab a little snackosaurus. Plant eaters walked on four feet so they could carry their heavy bodies. Some of the bigger plant eaters needed around a ton of food per day, literally. Imagine animals so big, they had to eat a house-sized pile of veggies on a daily basis. Still, a huge bush a day keeps the doctor away. Is that where that started? There are around 700 known species of extinct dinosaurs. Sounds like a lot, but we probably haven't discovered them all. Five years back, they found out about a new type of dinosaur. It had these stubby horns right above its eyes, which looked so much like the comic book character. They named it Hellboy. Hop on the Bright Side of Life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. In the 90s, scientists discovered a crater in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. You know the story. Around 66 million years ago, a meteor the size of Mount Everest hit our planet and filled the atmosphere with dust, gas, and debris that caused a serious climate catastrophe. It triggered a heat wave and a blast wave that went up into the atmosphere, partially blocking out the sun. Game over. Thanks for playing, dinosaurs! The age of humans never crossed over with the dinosaur era. Dinosaurs disappeared more than 60 million years ago but they existed on Earth for 160 million years. Modern-looking humans have only been around for about 250,000 years. Only 59 million years to go, people! Not all the dinosaurs were on vacation in Mexico when the asteroid hit. They lived all over the globe. Some lived in deserts, while others lived in areas near ancient rivers surrounded by thick forests and rich vegetation. They weren't too picky. 
So they lived wherever, even Antarctica. But it wasn't covered in snow back then. Both poles had forests growing on them. Most people imagine all dinosaurs to be grayish-green because of the movies. Plus, we usually just think of them as giant lizards. Scientists still don't know much about dinosaur skin tones, but researchers recently found some evidence that dinosaurs totally embraced the rainbow. One little guy had white and orange rings on his tail. Dinosaur is Greek for terrible lizard. Scientists used to think dinosaurs were mostly cold-blooded like snakes, lizards, or other reptiles. Turns out they were wrong, maybe. Some evidence pointed to them being warm-blooded like mammals. Somewhere in 2014, scientists discovered that most dinosaurs were mesotherms. A little of this, a little of that. And it turned out many of them had feathers, just like little baby tea. It helped them regulate their body temperature. Another thing we got from the movies and totally thought was real? What dinosaurs sound like? Producers usually mix together a bunch of animal noises to get that authentic dino roar. T-Rex is usually a mix of alligator, tiger, and the squealing of a baby elephant. And that dreaded T-Rex breath? It was just the sound of air going through a whale's blowhole. Are you ready to find out what social media you would be? Let's start! 1. What makes you the happiest? A. Traveling or shopping B. Helping others C. Learning new things D. Spending time with my family Option A brings you 30 points B is worth 20 points C brings you 10 points and D is worth 40 points How long can you survive without your phone? A. 10 seconds B. Years, I'm not attached to it at all C. As long as it takes for a new notification to pop up D. I check it once an hour and feel fine If you picked A, add 40 points to your score. If you went with B, it's worth 10 points. C brings you 30 points and D, 20 points. 3. Do you have many friends? A. Not really. I'm focused on my success and self-development. B. One or two since high school. We're still very close. C. Plenty of them. We meet up often. D. I used to have many friends but we don't see each other very often. A brings you 20 points. B is worth 30. C is worth 40 points. D brings you 10 points. 4. You've got your first really good bonus. What do you spend it on? A. That designer bag or watch I've been eyeing for months. B. I'd book a trip somewhere for my family. C. I'd invest it in something to make that money work. D. I'd transfer it to some charity. If option A is your choice, you get 10 points. Did you go with B? It's worth 40 points. C brings you 20 points. D is worth 30 points. 5. Do you follow the news about celebrity life? A. Nope. Don't really care and never have. B. Only when the title is super catchy. C. Absolutely. I have to know all the latest gossip. D. There are a couple of celebrities I like and follow online. A. Adds 10 points to your score. B. Is worth 20. And C. Is a 30-point option. D. Brings you 40 points. What is the goal of social media? A. To express yourself, generate cool content, and get followers. B. To get motivation, to learn, and grow. C. To always know what others are up to. D. To speak up on important matters. If you chose A for this one, you get 20 points. B is worth 30 points. If you went with C, add 40 points to your score. And D is worth 10. 7. If you're a movie character, would you be A. A princess waiting to be rescued from the tower B. 
A superhero saving the world. C. A villain who scares everyone but becomes good in the end. D. Some cute bunny with huge eyes. A brings you 20 points. B is worth 10. C is a 30-point option. And D gives you 40 points. 8. What do you do first thing in the morning? A. Check my social media, of course. B. Drink a glass of water and do some exercise. C. Send a good morning message to all my group chats. D. Go for a walk. A. Adds 40 points to your score. B. Is worth 10. C. 20 points. And D. 30 points. 9. How easily do you trust people? A. Quite easily. They haven't let me down. B. It takes me at least a year to really trust someone. C. I don't trust anyone at all. D. If someone close to me says you can trust this person, I believe them. If you went with A, add 40 points to your score. B brings you 20. C is worth 10 points. And D is a 30-point option. 10. Do you answer messages and comments from strangers? A. I have private accounts and only friends can message or comment. B. No, I block them immediately. C. Yes, if it's something meaningful and friendly. D. Of course, I like to get into online fights. A. Gives you 40 points. B. 20 points. C. 30 points. And D. Is worth 10 points. 11. Would you quit your job if your boss had opposing views on something important to you? A. Yes, my opinion is the only right one. B. Only if they make me publicly denounce my views. C. No, I just pretend to agree with them. D. No, I'd try to adopt their point of view. Option A brings you 10 points. B. 20 points. C. 30 points. And D. 40 points. 12. Now, open the settings on your phone and tell me what takes the most of its memory. A. Photos. I have 2,000 photos of my cat alone. B. Videos. I still need to edit and post them. C. Messenger apps. D. Games. If you choose A, you get 30 points. B gives you 20 points. C is worth 40 points. And D, 10 points. Time to sum up your points. If you scored 120 to 190 points, you're Twitter. You have an opinion on everything, and you aren't afraid to share it with others. When someone doesn't agree with you, you're happy to explain why you're in the right. You won't back down, even if it's someone with more authority. You like to learn the news first and believe no information is useless. You're witty and your jokes are smart and sophisticated. Those who ended up with 200 to 250 points, it looks like you're a walking Pinterest. You have great taste and like to make the world around you a prettier place, from your phone wallpaper to your backyard. You always have some cool ideas on where to go and what to give someone for their birthday. You like to sort things out into groups, order is really important to you. Did you get 260 to 310 points? Congrats! Your inner social network is Facebook. You have a broad spectrum of interests and you like to learn from different sources. You put a lot of your time and soul into staying close to other people. You always find a kind word for everyone and genuinely care about their issues. People often ask you for advice or just share with you because they know you're a great listener and have a lot of life experience. If you have 320 to 370 points, looks like you'd be Instagram if you were born a social network. You never say no to an opportunity to go somewhere new or some new people and take a selfie with them, of course. You're a visual learner and you feel happier when you see something beautiful or cute. You always like to know what's going on in the lives of others and never get bored of seeing their breakfast choices. 
Those who got 380 to 430 points, put your hands up and jump forward. Now freeze. Yes, we're filming a TikTok dance here because that's your inner social network. You're full of energy, love a fast-paced life, and don't hold on to the past too much. You're brave enough to experiment with new approaches and formats. You're a fast learner, and if someone can't get to the point instantly, you get easily bored. In case you came to the finish line with 440 to 490 points, LinkedIn is the social network for your personality. You're goal-oriented and know exactly what you want. You see other people as prospective, useful connections for your career. You like networking, but never share anything personal. It's rather hard for you to let people close, and you can only show your true self to your old friends. You like to analyze things and make plans. If you have somewhere between 500 and 550 points, you like watching videos so much, YouTube is basically your second self. Your interests are diverse, and you are equally excited to find out how to build a log cabin and why there are little triangles above some windows on the plane. You find comfort in the voices of your favorite vloggers and like following instructions. You're a great team player, and the community means a lot to you. Those who got over 550 points. What was that sound? Looks like you got a new message on WhatsApp. It is your kind of social media since you're super communicative and like to share literally everything with your family and friends. You feel uncomfortable when you don't have access to your phone for some reason. You worry a lot about your dearest ones and need to hear their opinion before making any decisions in life. Some villagers have gone missing from the kingdom of Niverburg. The king calls you and your squad to one dragonborn monk, one half-elf druid, one tiefling rogue, and one dwarf wizard. You'll need to enter the Dark Woods, the motherland of dark magic. Find the missing people and bring them back alive. But the road ahead is filled with monsters lurking in the shadows. If you succeed, the king will give you a thousand gold coins each. But if you don't, well, let's hope you do. Now, roll the dice to see what fate has in store for you. Exciting stuff, right? Well, you can hop into a world of make-believe and go on countless quests like this if you are a Dungeons & Dragons player. All you need is a bit of imagination and a sense of adventure. First published in 1974, Dungeons & Dragons has gained millions of fans over the years. Being the first commercially available fantasy tabletop role-playing game probably helped. There is one player in particular who is, fair to say, the biggest fan of the game, running the same game for 40 years now breaking the record for the longest continuous Dungeons & Dragons game ever. That's a guy who doesn't have any commitment issues, people. Robert Wardhoff started his Dungeons & Dragons campaign in 1982, when he was still a teenager. But back in that time, the game was not the sensation it is today. Many concerned parents considered it a threat. They thought it was brainwashing their children, pulling them to the dark side, so to speak. That's why, for a while, many kids felt the need to hide the fact that they were playing it. The community Wardhoff grew up in was no different. He says there was a lot of judgment towards the game, so when he watched Stranger Things, it hit home for him. He's thankful that shows as such and movies like The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit have created an acceptance of fantasy themes among the popular culture. Fascinated by the wondrous and magical world the game was offering, he and a couple of his friends started playing the game. All they needed were one 20-sided dice and a few sheets of paper to create the characters they wanted to embody. However, Wardhoff was not a player, but the Dungeon Master. In short, the DM. DMs are the ones who organize each game session. They act as both the writer and the storyteller. They create the plot and the setting for each adventure develop all the challenges the players will face and pick the creatures they will have to fight. They have total control over everything within the game except for the actions of the player's characters. They're also the ones responsible for describing everything to the players during the game. Calling Wardhoff a good DM would be an understatement. He's an epic one. He started with only four people, but he's guided around 60 players since then. People have been driving and flying from all over Canada to take part in his never-ending game. But what is his secret to running the best and the longest Dungeons & Dragons game in the world? 
Grab your pen and paper to write down his formula, you aspiring DMs out there. Number one, practice makes perfect. Wardhoff certainly had his share of practice. Over the course of 40 years, he estimates he had spent over 20,800 hours playing the game. That is, minus all the time he spent making his 30,000 hand-painted figurines and custom handmade terrains and towns. Number 2. Give it your all Wardhoff lives to keep the game going. He even makes major life decisions according to his game, like buying a house with a basement big enough to become his gaming area, as well as fit his 30,000-piece game set. He might need to call his realtor to find a bigger house soon. Number 3. Keep the world interesting Wardhoff works as a history professor for the University of Western Ontario, and his career certainly has an impact on the world he's creating for his players. He describes it as an alternative version of historical Earth. So he doesn't hesitate to drive inspiration from philosophy, sociology, and incorporate real-world history to create a unique story. Number 4. Don't let the rules limit you Even though there is a rulebook for both the players and the Dungeon Masters, with the most recent one being the 5th edition, Wardhoff doesn't really stick to it. He's bending and breaking the rules to fill in some holes that he found in it. So now he has his own rule system to which gamers call a homebrew rule system. When Dungeons & Dragons first came out, one of the lines in the Dungeon Master Guide said, Use the written material as your foundation and inspiration. And that's what he has been doing ever since. Not bound by the old, current, or the upcoming rules, he can come up with totally new races, nations, cultures, and mythologies. This freedom helps keep his game flowing since no player needs to stop and check things. And as his game gets bigger and bigger, he keeps developing and changing his rule system to make it even better than before. But this doesn't mean he's not using what the Dungeons & Dragons manual already offers. He still includes monsters like Demogorgon in his games. Number 5. Mix and Match Genres To be able to create a plot with unrivaled complexity, Wardhoff makes use of all different story genres. He enriches his games with vengeance, romance, and all types of dangerous adventures. Number 6. Create high stakes for your players More than 500 characters have been made and played within Wardhoff's game over the course of 40 years. This large number might be due to his rule of no coming back to life. This is because he tries to keep the stakes as high as possible for his players. If a character eventually is out of hit points, which are lives, there's no coming back. The only way for players to enter back into the game is if they already have spare characters. If not, they're out of the game for good. He thinks this creates emotion, excitement, and tension. And he's probably right, since he saw grown people weep at the table because of their characters being out of the game. Number 7. Stay Organized it's not easy curating quests as well as tracking the adventures of more than 50 players. But there are also thousands of subplots and sub-campaigns going on, as well as numerous story arcs of all the different characters that often span decades. And he has to remember them all. So buying a planner wouldn't hurt. Number 8. Don't let personal stuff affect your game. It sure must feel great to be able to play Dungeons & Dragons with your dad. Or maybe not if your ex-boyfriend is still in the game as a player. Yep, that's the case for Wardhoff's daughter who joined his game as a fairy when she was around 6. Now she's at the age of 20 and still playing it, alongside her ex. Because Wardhoff has the principle that once he allows somebody to come into the game, he's never going to stop them from playing it. Talk about awkward. Number 9. Keep reminding yourself what truly matters. To Wardhoff, the game represents friendship. He believes that friendship needs something to hold them together as people go through their lives. He says he made some great friends along the way, and he thinks that as long as he keeps the game alive, he won't lose any of them since there will always be a reason to get together. Wardhoff is very welcoming of new players and characters as he doesn't ever intend on quitting. So who knows, if you're a nice kid, one day you can join his game. If you think about it, your life is a lot like a video game. 
You could say it's like a role-playing game most of all. All you need to do is add the right icons to your screen, like your health and energy bars. There's your inventory as well, with your phone, wallet, and keys in it. And of course, everyone's got a skill bar. But let's start from the very beginning. Even when you're a baby, the game difficulty is already set to hard. All your skills are at level zero, and your health bar is tiny. Which is why you only sleep or eat most of the time to make sure it grows. When you reach level one, you unlock the ability to walk. But the world map is still closed to you, because there are lots of dangers you're just not ready for yet. It turns out, this game has a really long demo mode called Childhood. Most game features are locked for now. Nearly all of your actions are set for you by your parents. They're like quest givers who help you gain the experience you need to make progress. Ignoring their instructions can make leveling up real tough. But if you're polite enough, they'll give you your first gold coins. As long as you're a child, you'll constantly be leveling up. But of course, it takes a really long time. Your health and skill bars get bigger as you go to school. It's not the most exciting magic academy, but the students there still carry out quests and learn new abilities. Congratulations, you've reached level 18. Now we're really getting into this role-playing game. You're facing a classic video game choice. You have to select your character class and the skill path you like the most to help you conquer the world. While lots of games have different character classes, most of us end up being the same one in real life. The adventurer who travels the world doing different tasks to earn gold and experience. And you still have tons of quests to do. That's right, it's also time to leave behind the safe part of the map where you grew up. This unfamiliar world is a little like a dark forest full of enemies. The trouble is, the bad guys out there are sometimes hard to overcome. These monsters have names like responsibility, work, and money. They keep coming back even when you thought you'd finally learned how to deal with them. But if you didn't slack off at school, one day you'll overcome them all. Imagine you're in a restaurant and your date asks you if you like animals. You confidently reply, I love cats. Your date sighs and says, I'm more of a dog person. Quick, go to the menu, reload the checkpoint, and change your answer. Uh, sorry, but you can't do that. Remember that this is one tough video game, and you're still playing on hard mode. This means that you only have one life. You can't just save and then go back if something goes wrong. Every decision and every action has consequences for you and the other players around you. But that just makes it more interesting. Interaction with other players is one of the most important parts of the game. But remember, you need to be a little careful here. The admins are a lot stricter than for other games. Breaking the rules and upsetting people could lead to a completely different game mode. And there isn't much to do in this version, except look at four walls and a grating on the window. On the plus side, the character customization in this game is fantastic. You can change your hairstyle and hair color, get tattoos and piercings, really anything you want. Oh, and the clothes? There's just no limit to the designer's imagination. With each new level you reach, you open up new abilities and new quests. You encounter tougher challenges, but get better rewards, like more gold or a bigger house. But there's one quest line that's really unique in this game. When you feel experienced enough, you can start a family and even create a new character. You'll transfer some of your skills to them and be their companion in the game until they're ready to go into the dark forest to fight the monsters on their own. You'll never get to control this character though. In this game, the plot isn't always about you. The AI does what it wants. There's a bunch of other stuff about this game that's really unusual as well. Let's take the graphics. They're just incredible, like Ultra HD. And the resolution is absolutely stunning. But the gameplay is pretty complicated compared to other games. You need to check your health bar all the time, build relationships with other characters, earn gold, and make sure you rest on time. But the story is the most interesting part. It's totally up to you what happens. Sure, it can be boring if you just lie on the couch and watch other people play, but try hard enough and your character could become really important. So you need to put the work in if you want it to be an interesting experience.
But there are lots of cool things in other adventure games that are missing from this one. For example, fast travel. Imagine what it would be like if we had this option. You wake up tired, but you have to go to work. Just go over to the portal and select the right location. Boom! You're already there! I think it's definitely time someone invented this. And we could sure use some cheat codes as well. Of course, no one likes a cheater on the server, but imagine how cool it would be. Don't have enough money? Just type in the cheat and watch the numbers in your bank account double. Feeling sick? Don't waste your health potion. Just use the cheat and your health bar is full again. But I've got to admit, playing at life like this would become boring. Imagining life as a video game helps us understand it a lot. A lot of what we do is about setting small tasks and looking for ways to accomplish them. With rewards and experience, you move on to more challenging quests. Your skills, gold, and health bars aren't infinite though, and you need to manage your resources carefully to reach the next level. Some people think that computer games can be really harmful. They say that gamers spend too much time in their virtual worlds and forget about reality. But there are actually a lot of benefits from playing games from time to time. Many of them are designed in the same way as our real lives, and they have plenty of features that teach us useful things. Games always reward us for our hard work. Playing a game from start to finish and making all that progress along the way can help you understand that it takes time and energy to get what you want. Hard work always pays off. Another useful thing that games provide is communication. Hundreds of millions of people play online games that bring them together in groups and teams. They have to achieve cohesion and use good teamwork to pass through a dungeon or win a match. Competitive games can help people learn to communicate and make compromises. And although it's all just for fun, this is exactly what we have to learn to do in real life as well. Only instead of a dungeon with a scary monster, we have to survive a day at the office with an angry boss. And one more thing. It's been proven that a person's strategic thinking and decision-making can improve when they play video games. In one experiment, a group of 50 young adults who had never played games before were asked to play an action game for 50 hours. Another group played a slow strategy game. The results showed that the action game helped to improve the young people's perception of visual information. Their decision-making skills also improved. This was thanks to the fast pace of the action game. In these kind of games, a large number of events happen one after another, forcing the player to act and make decisions. This can have an effect on people's real lives. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like.